It's very cool watching that number grow. It is, and I know that we're going to give people another couple seconds to log in, but I think I can probably get started chatting with folks. So as people get logged in, I want to say welcome. My name is Liz Dombrowski. I'm the certification manager here at the Events Industry Council. We have a lot of information to cover this morning, so we're going to kind of dive right in as people continue to log in. So just real quickly, you have some housekeeping notes. So first off, just welcome. Today our focus is we are going to focus mostly on remote proctoring and year-round testing. We'll also kind of cover some of those basics of the CMP certification process. Throughout the session, please submit your questions through the Q&A panel. We're going to try to answer as many questions throughout the webinar, and then we'll also have some Q&A at the end of the session. Um, yes, we will share the slides with you afterwards. Yes, we are recording the session and we'll post it on YouTube. Yes, you will get one hour of CE for completing this session. And also, remember, we are using closed captions today for the session. So if you are looking to turn those on, go to your Zoom control panel and click on closed caption. We also have the chat feature there that I think most of you have already seemed to figure out. So feel free to chat away. But if you have questions you want Alika or myself to address, please put them in the Q&A panel. So with that, I'm actually going to turn things over to Alika Garcia, the immediate past chair of the CMP Governors Commission. Welcome, Alika. Thank you, Liz. Thank you again for having, having me today. I really appreciate it. It's really exciting watching this number grow. Um, just before the call, we had a practice session and over 700 folks had registered for today's call. So I'm, I'm intrigued by this number that's growing and, and everyone from all around that's joining us. I saw Ghana, Bahamas. I understand it's a little bit sultry in DC. Just saw Hong Kong. So thank you all for your time today. I'm excited to be here as a representative of the CMP Governance Commission. Um, and it's really important for us to talk about the CMP during this uncertain time. It's a community that I feel, feel that has given me a lot and I feel that it has all, so much more to give to um, all those that are interested in this designation. Um, as many of you may not know, the Events Industry Council launched, launched the CMP in 1985, and that was to enhance the knowledge and the performance of the meeting professionals and promote the status and the credibility of the profession that we all love so much, and really to develop advanced uniform standards of what we do in our professional life. And I really truly believe this with all my heart, and, and all of my team members over the years have always been CM CMPs, but we're uniquely qualified to plan things and organize them and align them with business strategies. And I feel that that is such a value that we can bring now and into the future in this world that we're living in. And it's really the basis for all the specialized credentials that we can build on. And it's for planners and suppliers alike. So I know as you join this community and you know folks in the profession that you will strengthen those relationships. And, and it's a global badge. I think it's important for us to remember that it's a global badge of excellence, right? It's a prolific, it's a rigorous, rigorous credential. And we have more than 11,000 CMPs in our community across 55 countries. That's a really important statistic, a metric. And I'm all about metrics. I just want to say that again, 11,000 CMPs over 55 countries. What an elite group to join. And one of the reasons I'm here today, Liz, you can go to the next slide, is um, to really reinforce our belief in the credential and to share the governance structure that comes with the CMP. Now, the exam itself is rigorous, it drives value, it's performance-based in terms of your knowledge, but it's also governed by this commission. And as a commission, what we do is we help the staff provide guidance and structure around what the program is, making sure that it's continuously relevant, making sure that it's serving our community of CMPs and what it stands for. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have a set of, um, of commitments that we serve for you as CMPs. We represent what you're seeking, what you're holding. We ensure the policies are developed appropriately, and we're really your voice with the EIC for the CMP um, community. And I think it's important in today's 
um, world is to let you know that this is a distinguished community of professionals and we seek to appoint those to the commission and nominations are held annually and it is a representation of the distinct and diverse folks that hold the CMP. So I welcome you on your journey to get your CMP and I hope that you are inspired to give back to the community and that we provide you with pertinent information on your professional journey. And with that, Liz, I'm gonna turn the call back over to you and wait for you to share all this great stuff that EIC has been doing for the CMP designation. Well, thank you, Alika. Um, I am going to try to be a whirlwind today and what we're gonna cover is we're gonna go through year-round testing policies, then we'll do a remote proctoring deep dive, and then I'm going to touch briefly on the more basics of CMP, how to prepare for the exam, what the initial requirements are, and so forth. Um, I'm already looking at the queue, the questions. I'm going to skip our polls. I encourage you to chat with your neighbors in the chat about the polls, about where you are in your CMP journey, when you want to take your exam, how do you think you want to take your exam, and kind of dig right into the meat just because I'm trying to be really cognizant of time today, guys. So, I don't believe in burying the lead, so we're not going to. If you were going to screenshot something, this is what is changing, this is what is staying the same. So, as of August 1st, we are going to transition to year-round testing. What that means is that you can take the CMP exam starting on August 1st, 365 days a year. You could theoretically take it on Christmas Day or New Year's Eve if that's what you wanted to do. You can also take the exam remotely proctored, and we're gonna go over what exactly that means. What's not changing is you still have to have 90 days between exam attempts. So if you take the exam on August 1st and you're not successful, you still have to wait 90 days before you can try again. And you still have to take the exam within your eligibility year. If you don't wanna take a remotely proctored exam, that's great, you can still go to a testing center just like you did before. We're also offering the same accommodations for testing accommodations under the ADA. None of that changes whether you're doing it remotely or in a center. So that's kind of the heavy hitters. I also wanted to remind everyone of some key dates and deadlines. If you are currently scheduled to sit your CMP and you wish to reschedule to sit a remotely proctored exam or just change your in-center date for whatever reason, the $75 reschedule fee is waived through July 31st. So if you are already scheduled and you want to change your appointment for any reason, please do not cancel your appointment. Go to the Prometric website, hit reschedule. You must reschedule your current appointment before July 31st to get a waiver of that fee. We're also still offering some discounts for candidates impacted by COVID-19. If you need access to those and you're, ha and you're having trouble with that, please reach out to our team at certification at eventscouncil.org. We'll continue to do virtual office hours throughout July with members of EIC staff like me or my friend Kat who's also on this call and members of the Governance Commission for just some informal Q&A throughout the month. And also you can always still reach us via email and phone, same as always. So with all that, I'm gonna dive into year-round testing really quickly. As a reminder, this all begins on August 1st. So there's no CMP exams between now and August 1st. You can schedule any day after during your eligibility window. If you do not pass, you must wait 90 days between attempts. And that's all year round testing is. So if there's no changes beyond that. I do, however, want to note that just like it is currently, the closer you are to the day you want to take your test, the more limited that site and day eligibility will be. So please remember to schedule your exam in advance because there might not be an appointment available tomorrow, but there will be appointments available a month from now or six weeks from now. So please still schedule your appointments in advance. Now this is what I think people are most excited about. And I'm going to spend probably about 20 minutes or so on remote proctoring. So when we moved to remote proctoring, we really had two goals. One is we want to obviously maintain that same level of reliability and have a valid way to test that is also convenient. And the other part of that is we just want to make testing as stress-free as humanly possible 
not only today because of COVID, but also for the future. So remote proctoring was something that EIC was moving towards even before COVID-19 arose, but we're excited that we're able to release it now to our community. So for those of you who haven't seen it yet, the system is called ProProctor. So ProProctor does follow that same standard security procedures that you see inside the physical global test center network. That means that we're able to leverage Prometric standard SOPs about check-in and security. We did have to make some modifications, obviously, to make sure it's administered online. Biggest differences that you'll notice when you're going through that process, and we're going to talk through what all of this looks like, is that it's 100% live monitoring throughout the environment. You're also going to do, when you check in what we call a comprehensive 360 degree environmental readiness check, we're going to walk through all those steps. There'll be live security agents throughout that process. And there's a lot more what I call proactive protocols, where they're proactively checking the devices you're using, they're checking your screen, and there's also a review and record functionality. So if there's any questions, myself and the ethics group through the Governance Commission can go back and view those recordings, which is the same as we see in the live testing centers. This does give us a lot greater access. So candidates are able to test now 24-7. They can test wherever is the most convenient. And what this means is for people, especially outside the continental United States, there's such greater access to the exam. We're especially in places where there were not as many testing centers available. It also means, especially for our US group, there's a lot more access on weekends and off hours for people who can't take a certification exam between nine to five. So we're really excited about that. So this is another thing that you might want to screenshot. It is also all posted on our website. I'm going to run through just a few of these very briefly and kind of some highlights that I noticed. I did a lot of extensive testing. I think I drove my family crazy by just testing out and being a secret shopper on this system. Some of the things that I want to highlight for you is you cannot have a dual monitor configuration. So when you take your exam, you can't be in a docking station. If you're on your laptop, you're only using your laptop, you can't use your big giant monitor in addition to that. You have to unplug it. Um, yes, you definitely need a webcam. It needs to be movable for the check-in process. So we'll go through kind of what that looks like as well, but I would say, you know, for the webcam, I know that I needed quite the cord on mine to, you know, look around my four corners and whatnot, so just make sure it's really movable. Another thing I wanted to flag for this group is that um, you definitely need to not, I wouldn't be overly concerned about your Wi-Fi if you're working from home on the regular now. You can use Wi-Fi. I did all of my testing on Wi-Fi, not a hard line. However, just obviously make sure that you're getting a strong signal. Prometric does recommend that you plug in via an Ethernet cord. Basically, now is not the time for your teenager to download his Xbox update when you're taking your certification exam. So just coordinate with your family because lack of signal strength can cause your exam to be disconnected. So no one wants to be in that situation. What I want to go through here is kind of what that process looks like. So we're going to talk about what you do before exam day and then the exam day experience. So when you sign up, or even before you sign up for remote proctoring, what I would encourage you do is you set up your room and computer as if it were exam day. Go through the whole process. Then we're gonna go through the system readiness check, which you can do today if you wanted. And then we'll go through downloading and installing the actual pro proctor application. So on the room setup side of things, and these are just a few examples per metric, gives lots and lots of very clear pictures about what your room should or shouldn't look like. So you must test inside, you cannot test outside. It needs to be in a room that's you know, well lit so the proctor can see everything. No background noises or disruptions. Now obviously we're gonna apply some common sense. We know that you have no control over when your neighbor mows the lawn, but you can't have the radio going. So no third parties in the room during your exam. That includes your pets and they cannot enter for the duration of the exam. So 
you, your workstation, my workstation right now would not pass muster. It needs to be free of pens, paper, or electronic devices, my notes. So basically, you can't have any content that could provide what we call an unfair advantage during the exams. And that actually includes your walls. So I know when I was doing some testing, they had me pull down, I had a CMP certificate. This is back when I was in the physical office doing some testing. So I had my, you know, CMP certificate on the wall, but they noticed it was CMP related, so they had me pull that certificate off the wall during the duration of my exam. So they will do a very thorough check of your environment as well. What I would recommend is set that up before exam day, get comfortable, so that way you're kind of familiar with the space in which you're working. Another thing I really recommend you do, and you can do this even before you sign up, you could do this literally right now on this webinar, is you can go run what we call a system readiness check. So there's the website listed there, and what will happen is Prometric will ask you if they can run a check of your system to make sure it's compatible. So what you'll see is it will go through the screen resolution and the operating system and the microphone. And I am one of those people. So I checked a couple different webinars and a couple different webcams and checked them all to make sure that I was using the ones that I wanted to and tested all of the above. And then when the system is ready for that, it will go ahead and it will encourage you then to either rerun it to your heart's content, but when you're comfortable with all of those settings, it will encourage you to download and install the ProProctor application. And this, I freely admit, is the most anticlimactic piece of the puzzle because when you download it and it's not your testing day, literally nothing happens. So I know I downloaded it, you know, a week before my first exam demo. And I was expecting just something to happen. And nothing does because it's not my exam day. So don't be worried. It'll walk you through the instructions for PCs versus Macs. Once you download it and it says that it's installed, there's nothing left for you to do. You're not going to run it until exam day. So you can do all of that today, even without an appointment, if you just kind of want to check things out. If you'd like. Um, some other little helpful hints, at least I think I thought and I learned as I was going through the testing process. Check on your webcam. This was something that I learned because, you know, I learned my webcam tries to make me look a lot better than I do because it has one of those settings on it to make my, everything a little blurry to make me look more awake at 6 a.m. But what that meant is that when I held up my ID, because they do physically check your ID, when I held up my ID, they couldn't read it because everything was blurry. So I needed to back out, turn off that setting, look like I needed that cup of coffee, and show my ID. So I would definitely make sure to test that type of thing and figure out all those setting pieces. Just get on Zoom with a colleague and hold up your ID to your webcam. Is it, is it legible? If not, do you need to change a setting? Do you need to think about using the built-in webcam on your laptop? versus a standalone webcam. Can you move the webcam? You can definitely use a webcam that is built into your laptop, and that's what I ended up, I thought was a little easier for me personally. But can I move that around? So I could move my laptop around really easily to show the product of the whole room. So I didn't have to fuss with that freestanding webcam that was you know, anchored to my big secondary screen. On the microphone side, you can use the microphone built into the speakers of your laptop or your, and just have it, you know, ambient noise in the room. But can you clearly be heard by the proctor? Because you do speak to them throughout that check-in process. And then also, I decided that I wanted to use a headset to hear the proctor versus having them come through the big speakers on my laptop. And that was just personal preference for me because I like the fact that my headphones, these are noise canceling. So I didn't have to worry about my neighbor mowing the lawn or whatnot. And that was to make my setting more distraction free for me. But on the flip side, I know that I'm comfortable wearing this particular set of headphones for four hours. So there's a lot of variables in terms of your personal preference for how you want to set up your technology 
on exam before exam day. So I really recommend doing all of this ahead of time, getting on Zoom or WebEx with a colleague, and just playing with your settings till you reach a point where you know that you personally will be comfortable. And then when you have the settings that you want, then go back and run that system readiness check from Prometric just to make sure that everything you're using or hoping to use is compatible with their needs. So you don't have to worry about any of that on testing day. Because what's the challenge is, is that once you launch your exam on testing day, you cannot update any settings on webcams, microphones, headsets once your exam is launched. So what your settings are when you launch, those are your settings for the duration of the exam. Okay, I will get off my soapbox. We're going to talk through exam day itself. So you've done all of this prep work. You're very prepared from a technology perspective. Now comes your day of testing. Here's what you have in the room with you. So what you need to have is your Prometric confirmation number. You get that via email when you sign up and then in the reminder emails itself. You need your valid government issued photo ID. You may need a mirror. So I know that I, this was a tricky one for me. And during my first demo exam, I dashed off to the bathroom and got my little makeup mirror. And the reason for that is if you're using the webcam that's built into your laptop, that means the proctor cannot inspect the actual screen of your laptop because the webcam literally can't point at that. So you hold up a mirror so that way they can take a look at your actual physical screen, your physical keyboard as part of that check-in process. You don't need a mirror if you're using a free standing webcam that has that flexibility to go around and look at the screen of what you're using to test. You can also bring in either scratch paper or a whiteboard, personal preference. You can bring in pen or pencil, whatever writing utensil you want, or dry erase marker if you're using a whiteboard. You can bring in two tissues. For the record, if you need more than that, they will let you go get more tissues. But that's all you can have on your desk when you're taking your test. What you can't have is any food, drink, water, even water, guys. You can't have books, obviously, or reference materials. You cannot have your cell phone in the room with you. No personal items like purses, no calculators, no rulers, nothing like that. Same exact standards that we follow in our testing centers. Okay. When it's time to take your exam, you can start launching your exam up to 15 minutes in advance of whenever your appointment time is, if it just makes you feel a little bit better. So you're gonna go ahead, you're gonna set up your computer in your room the exact way that you did it before your exam day, so that way you know you're comfortable. You're gonna click in the link in your confirmation email, and it will encourage, it will take you to the screenshot that you see on the right, will have you put in your confirmation ID, it'll have you put in the first four letters of your last name, It'll encourage you to find your exam, and then when it's time to launch, it'll hit launch. Again, it'll let you launch up to 15 minutes before your appointment. If you log in too early, it'll literally just ask you to come back a little later. So when it's time, you hit launch. And then at that point forward, you're going to be in the exam system. So ProProctor, that application that you downloaded ahead of time, will launch. And what that will do is it's going to freeze everything else on your computer. So you won't be able to change any appointments, any settings, any volume, nothing. It'll lock down all your screens except whatever you have identified as your primary screen. Because remember, there's no dual monitors permitted during testing. What you'll do then is what we call our solo check-in process. You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. It will have all of the rules and regulations and ask you to attest that you have read those. You will go through that system check one more time that you did before exam day, just to validate that you know they understand which microphone you're using, which webcam you're using. Next, you'll go through an image capture, and you're simply gonna position your face in your webcam following the guides on the screen and click the capture button. They are just taking your photo to validate that you really are the same person who's going to sit the actual exam itself. Then they're going to do the same thing with your photo ID, which you will hold up, make sure it's not blurry, and that all the text is readable, and you're going to click Capture. 
once you go through that, it'll, what was going to pop up next is the readiness checklist. And that's going to ensure that you have everything that you need to take your exam. It's going to remind you that you can't have water or coffee in the room. It's going to ask you to confirm that you know you have the whiteboard you want to use with you because once you go through that process, it will, it, it will also give you a chance if you need to duck out and use the restroom before your test starts, that's your last opportunity to do this. So take a few minutes when you get to that readiness checklist. Make sure your, set, your space is set up the way you want it. Make sure you have everything you need. Take a breather, get a drink, visit the washroom. When you're ready, you can come back in and then you can say that you're ready to go and you'll be passed to a candidate readiness agent and they'll do the security check-in. So this process is, it mirrors what you go through in the testing center. This is lengthy. It can take between 10 and 15 minutes. It, a lot of this is gonna be contingent upon the room in which you're testing. So I know that I found it a lot easier to test in my small little office with the four walls than I found to test in my open kitchen, living room, dining room downstairs because the proctor just physically had less space to inspect. So that's why we recommend that you know you set up your room in advance. When you get in front of the readiness agent, they're first going to check that you are who you say you are. They're going to have you re-hold up your photo ID front and back and just confirm your name, your email, the name of the test you're taking. I would encourage everyone to say certified meeting professional exam, not CMP exam. These proctors are working with hundreds of certification exams every day. They may not recognize the acronym right away, but they definitely know certified meeting professional. They're going to go ahead, they're going to inspect your whiteboard or your scratch paper. They're going to re-verify what hardware you're using. That you're using a laptop and not a desktop. That you're planning to use a wired mic versus the speaker is built in. So that way they're going to verify that the hardware you're saying you're using mirrors what they see on your physical person. Once they go through all of that, they're going to do the room scan. And they will start with, if you're using the webcam that's built into your laptop, they'll start by asking you to hold up that mirror so they can inspect the physical screen and the keyboard of your laptop. If you are Using a webcam that has a little more mobility, they'll just have you whirl it around so they can inspect that laptop screen. Next, they're going to do the room itself. They're going to look in all four corners, the ceiling corners of the room. They're going to look at all four walls, including the wall behind your desk. So if you have, like me, a little pegboard with a whole lot of notes on it, they will ask you to remove those notes for your exam. So I would encourage you clear off all those before your test. So that way, basically, if they see writing, they will ask you to pull it down off of that space. They're also then going to ask you to look behind your desk and beneath your desk. So that one was a tricky one for me. That's why I decided that, you know, my webcam that was standalone, didn't have a long enough cord for me to drag all the way underneath my desk so they can inspect that. That's why I went with my built-in laptop webcam. They look at the underside of my desk. They look at the underside of my chair that I'm sitting on. They may ask you to confirm a door is closed, adjust the blinds so they can see, turn on an additional light. Basically, they're trying to make sure that they have a really good look at your room before you even begin testing. Next, what they're gonna do what we call a person check. This really is similar to, well it is, it's identical to what you experience in a testing center. They're going to ask you to empty out all your pockets and hold them out so there's nothing in there. You're gonna be doing all of this through the webcam. They are going to inspect all jewelry and glasses. If you have any, so that's why we ask you not to wear any jewelry except wedding rings or, you know, religious jewelry to the testing center. They will inspect all of it. They'll ask you to roll up your sleeves to your elbows so they can look at your arms and make sure that there's nothing written there. Basically think of it like TSA if TSA was on a webcam. 
that's kind of what that inspection looks like. And then once you go through that whole process, then the readiness agent is going to walk through and confirm that you understand the break policy for the exam, which I do have another slide on. But just to clarify right now as well, you can take a break during a remotely proctored exam, just like in the testing center. There's up to two 15-minute breaks. No, you can't use your cell phone during the break. No, you can't go look up the answers in a book during the break. Yes, you can go get a drink of water or use the restroom during a break. Um, once you, after that, you'll be asked if you understand and agree to these policies. We hope that you say yes. Once you're ready to go and you agree to these policies, then we'll pass you on and you'll actually take the exam itself. So, this should be remarkably similar because it's identical to taking the exam in a testing center. It's obviously still on the computer, still 165 multiple choice questions, still ABCD. The actual exam is a three and a half hour block. Most candidates are spending four hours in the exam itself between the tutorial and the survey and the non-disclosure agreement and whatnot. That's why you see a four hour appointment. This mirrors that process identically. The one thing I wanted to call to your attention is during your exam itself, the proctor will be able to see you through the webcam. However, they will not be on video because it's really distracting to have a person on video in the corner of your screen. However, there's a chat box there, and you can always chat with your proctor through the chat box, or you can just physically speak and they can hear you as well that way. And we ask that when, if you need to take an unscheduled break or if you have a question that requires the proctor to speak with you, please chat them through that chat box and they will test that functionality out with you to confirm that you understand how the chat box works prior to your exam launching. Now on the functionality side, again, it is identical to what you see at the testing center. So at the top, you see the questions, you see your four options. There's a scroll bar on the left that lets you jump between all the questions. You can still strike out, highlight. There's an on-screen calculator. That's why we do not permit you to bring a calculator. Um, at the very end of your test, you can go back or throughout the exam. You can go back and review any questions that you flagged for later. So when you're ready to finish, you'll hit the finish button up at the top. There's going to be two additional pop-ups that just confirm that you're really ready to finish, just like in the testing center, just to safeguard against accidental clicks. And finally, I do want to just briefly reiterate that exam break policy for remote proctored exams. So up to two 15-minute unscheduled breaks. It mirrors our test center policy. While you're on break, the exam time, that three and a half hour window, will continue to time down while you're on the break. When you come back into the room, you'll be required to recheck in by, you know, having your glasses inspected, raising up your sleeves, emptying your pockets before you're able to start retesting your exam. And that check-in process can take about five minutes. And again, you cannot access any forbidden materials during breaks. So all of our proctors, both in center and remote, they're trained and notice suspicious behaviors that could indicate that potentially a candidate access materials during a break based upon the behavior when they come back into the testing room. And they are authorized to end an exam in cases of suspected cheating. And we're very confident that our policies here are following best practices as is that our peer organizations, as well as our accrediting boards, are following for remotely proctored testing. So that, I know I spoke for quite a while about remotely proctored testing. I'm really quickly now going to shift to in-center testing and some of the COVID-19 enhancements there. And then we'll go into initial certification prep and then we'll open up for q and A. I'm going to go really, really fast here to make sure we have ample time for Q&A because I'm currently looking at 47 questions. So I'm going to go bright, brief, and gone on the rest of these slides. 
So if you are still choosing to take it in center, you can absolutely do so. That check-in process mirrors what it was before. There's a few caveats for COVID-19. If you are taking an exam inside a testing center right now, you are required to wear a mask for the duration of your appointment. The only exceptions to that rule is because you have an accommodation required under the ADA that means that you cannot wear a mask. Also in a testing center, they are no longer using dry erase boards because they're worried about cross-contamination. They're switching from dry erase boards back to pencil and paper, which will be disposed of by the, by the candidates after the exam. They're considered single-use items. That process beyond that remains the same. Again, ID procedures are the same between both. My one question, my one request for everyone here is that your first and last name, regardless of in-person or remotely proctored exams, needs, needs, needs to match what you list in your CMT account. So we need to know the name of your legal ID for you to take your test. If you have a name that you're using for business purposes, we're happy to change that on your records after you pass your exam. So that way you can then advertise your CMP over, over your chosen business name and the staff team will walk you through that if you have questions about it. Now, we're, we don't require your middle name, so don't worry if your middle name does not match. That's not information that Prometric worries about for this. Um, I'm gonna breeze over check-in because it is literally verbatim. I'm also going to breeze over the testing rooms because the same items are prohibited inside the center as are when you remotely proctored. I am going to re-emphasize the break policy for in-center exams. Again, you can take an unscheduled break up to two 15-minute breaks. No, you can't use your cell phone. The one thing that I want to emphasize here is due to COVID-19, most of the jurisdictions are currently required to turn off their water fountains in the testing centers which we're, I'm sure we're all noticing is we're just, you know, running necessary errands at the grocery store and whatnot. So water fountains at most testing centers, they're required to have turned off. So if you're taking in a, in a, an appointment in a testing center, there may not be water fountains available during an unscheduled break. And I just want people to be cognizant of that. And I also want to reiterate what happens if something goes on before your exam. This doesn't impact remote proctoring in the same way, but for testing centers, if there's an unforeseen circumstance where your exam needs to be canceled, because you know, our most, our greatest fear right now, it used to always be snowstorms in the, in the winter, but now it is people are worried about COVID-19. If your appointment needs to be canceled because of a change of policy about what can be opened in the jurisdiction, Prometric will reach out to you proactively before your appointment to reschedule you. So if you if this is you, we really hope it won't be you, you will be offered a free complimentary reschedule if there is an act of God that changes your that means your exam is not able to occur in person. All right. For in person, same exact test. So I'm not even going to talk about this slide. Nothing has changed between the two types of appointments. The NDA is verbatim. The functionality is verbatim. I'm going to go through this last section because I feel like we probably might have some questions here. Now that we've talked about all the logistics of taking the exam, how do you prepare to take the exam? So what I want to emphasize here is the staff team will help you walk through the process if you have questions. So this is the cheat sheet process. Again, this is all posted up on our website. If you take one action today, if you haven't already during this webinar, take the five minutes, create an account on eventscouncil.org. That way we can make sure that you always receive updates as things change. None of these eligibility requirements are changing in light of remote proctoring. So they do remain the same. On the experience side, you have two options. I'd say 95% of people are going in with experience option one, which is that 36 months of professional experience in meetings, events, exhibition, hospitality, tourism. It doesn't need to be consecutive, but it needs to be within the last five years based upon whatever data it is that you apply. 
The other 5% of people are going in under option two, which is 24 months of industry-related experience and an industry-related degree. So for the second option, you do have to hold an associate's degree or higher in hospitality, tourism, or event management. You then also still need supplemental education. And again, there's two options. Most people are going in under option one, which is that 25 clock hours. Option two is the industry internship, which we mostly see for people who apply with an industry-related degree. So when we talk about that industry internship, that means that they've done an internship within the last five years based upon the date they apply. That's about 200 or more hours of work experience with a professional organization that's through an accredited educational institution or your university. So basically, you did an, an internship for college credit is what we're looking for under that requirement. Then when you're ready to apply, just from a sheer process perspective, when you have your experience, when you have your education, you're going to fill out the application online. You're going to pay your exam fee. Our team takes about three to five weeks to review applications. Once your application is approved, you'll receive a one-year eligibility window. Okay. And I know I'm going lightning speed, guys. Once that occurs and you receive your eligibility window, then you can pay your exam fee, schedule your test either remotely or in person based upon your personal preference. It's 100% first come, first serve. So I recommend that you try to schedule earlier, but also be cognizant that you can technically make four exam attempts. We don't want you to need four exam attempts within your eligibility year. So don't try to sign up for an exam on the last day of your eligibility year. Try earlier just in case you happen to need the second try. On the preparation side, a lot of it is preparing. A lot of people prepare for the exam before they officially apply. So go through the CMPIS. Well, I think that's my next slide. If not, it's two slides from now. We also have practice exams. So you're here at the very beginning of your journey. Download our handbook download the CMP International Standards. That is a very descriptive book of what is covered on the CMP exam. We also have three supplemental recommended manuals from which we recommend that you consider purchasing and reading through. One is the Events Industry Council Manual. One is the APEX Glossary, which is again through Events Industry Council. The other is PCMA's PMM, Professional Meetings Management. So those are the best resources as you prepare for your exam. I also wanted to just give you a snapshot of the actual CMPIS. As you can see, on the right-hand side is a breakdown of the exam itself. So when we talk about what's covered on the exam, 10% of your score is from strategic planning, 5% is from risk management, and a lot of times people go, what does that actually mean? So the CMPIS is what's really helpful here. So under strategic planning, it's going to list all of the skills and sub-skills that we mean when we talk about what is strategic planning. So what I generally recommend people do is they go down to the sub-skill level and they go and, and you ask yourself, do I really fundamentally understand how working with stakeholders, creating goal statements to specify how meeting an event will achieve its mission? Do I know how to do that? And where are the sections in the EIC manual, the APEX glossary, and the PMM that talk me through that process? And just run down the list and use that to focus your studying. Okay. We're going to talk about exam results. Again, we're not going to bury the lead. This is what everyone hopes to see. You get your exam results on exam day. So as soon as you take your test, What's going to happen is you're going to have an email by the time you either go back to your locker or log out of ProProctor that will take you to your official exam results. What it will say is whether you passed or failed. If you pass, it just says congratulations, you passed. If you're not quite so successful, you'll also receive a diagnostic, which goes back to that CMPIS, and it will tell you if you're above or below that line of minimum competency. 
So if you do need to retake your exam, it will give you a number, unlike the pass, which is just the pass, but then it will also give you where you were deficient so you can spend more time focusing on those areas as you study for your retake. Okay, on the maintenance side, once you become a CMP, you have to maintain it to keep it. So easiest way to do that, through your online account, just keep it up to date with contact information so we can always remind you. Um, for renewals, remarkably similar to initial certification. There's 25 hours of CE, or we have a volunteer opportunity through industry support. You need current industry experience, and that's how you maintain the CMP. So I know that this was lightning, lightning speed. I'm going to skip the poll again. And I am actually going to shift us now to Q&A. So if, Alika, if you are still here with me, do we have any fun questions that have come in? <laughs> I'm here, sorry, I was on mute. We have, a, okay. <laughs> we have a lot of questions, right? So I'm gonna start Oof. at the bottom. I was trying to track them all. Um, so here's one, how long do you suggest studying prior to taking the test? Yeah, I'd say a lot of that's personal preference in terms of what knowledge are you coming in the door with? I know, um, I don't know if you remember this, Aliga, but one, one of the things that we see after the exam is there's that optional survey. We ask people, how long do you take the did you take the study before you took this thing? And the most common answer is between six and nine months. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do, let's see, what, oh, here, what is the code to use the $50 off the initial certification registration fee? Hmm. So, if you need the code, it depends on your situation. That's why I can't just say insert this. So gotcha. email the team at certification at eventscouncil.org with your documentation and we'll get you the right direction with the right code. If we completed an internship for college credit through a local employer, winery slash restaurant, hotel, etc., will this count or does the employer need to be a nationally recognized corporation organization? No, it does not. So we it doesn't matter what company what the company name is, it rather matters what your job duties are. So what we'll ask you to do is literally upload your resume and then also describe to us how you're doing, what you're doing day to day, and how that relates back to the meetings and events industry and the planning process. This is an interesting one. Um, for the 36 months of professional experience. How many hours a week is considered full-time? So when we talk about full-time, we're talking about 35.5 hours a week. Now we understand that not everyone necessarily is working full-time, so that's why we say equivalent thereof. So if you're in a role because you're working 20 hours a week, we're, I'm gonna have to do some fast math. We're gonna expect that you are working there for six years. But however, remember the rule is that we only go back in time five years. So that was a horrible, horrible math example. <laughs> um, I, there's so many coming in, I lost my place. Um, there was one here, I can't find it exactly. Here it is. Do you still give an extra 30 minutes if English is not our first language with the remote test? We do. So testing accommodations, including English as a second language accommodation, which is a standard 30 minutes of additional testing time, is following the exact same process. So what we ask that you do, and this is for all testing accommodations, is don't schedule your exam until your accommodation is approved. Because if we schedule you for a test, but we don't give you the extra 30 minutes, then you just have to cancel your test. So your cadence for any type of accommodation should be become eligible, sit the exam, follow the accommodations process listed on our website, or just reach out to the team if you have questions about that process. And once you're set up with your accommodation, then you can go ahead and schedule through the online system. Thank you. There's, a, there's several questions here about 
the, the testing center. So I'm going to generalize these, right? So okay. um, you want to go to the ProMetric website, right, to look mm -hmm. to see what centers are open. Because if any of us have learned through the last four months, today California is open, tomorrow California is not open type thing, right? So it's very mm -hmm. fluid situation, correct? Correct. <laughs> The other question I had when you were presenting is if I plan to take it at a live center and then they had to cancel me, how hard is it for me to pivot and go take it virtually? Um, frankly, it's not hard at all. So if anyone is feeling antsy about it, it's just, you know, free for all. You could theoretically reschedule your exam every day for free between now and July 31st. I don't ask that you do that. I think that would drive our team crazy. But it's really simple. It's an online process. You can reschedule in the course of just a few minutes. Um, another thing about the testing centers is they're also all flagged as essential versus non-essential. So just keep that in mind as you're going through the process. So for example, right now, Florida, they're only permitting essential testing. And what that means essentially is testing that's required by law. So that's our doctors that need to maintain their licenses to continue supporting patients today. So there are certain testing centers in certain areas that they're essential only. So it won't let you schedule an appointment there even though it's listed as open. So just be careful of that tag. There's a couple questions. I'm not going to ask them specifically, but there, there are questions about, well, what if, I, what if I don't have a clean room, or what if I don't have an area, or what if I have a medical condition and I need more breaks, or this and that. I, I want to generalize it, uh, Liz, and, and let me know if this is incorrect. If there is a, an accommodation that needs to be made, then I say, do we ask Prometric, or do we ask EIC? Like, for example, what if I'm pregnant, right? And mm -hmm. I, I need to go more than the two 15-minute breaks that I get. I'm going to say that we are an evolved as a society and as an organization that we will make accommodations for folks who have special needs, just like yes. people who can't wear a mask, right? There's a condition they can't wear a mask during the testing, that if you have a unique situation, who do they tell to make sure that we try and make the right accommodations? You're going to tell Events Industry Council, not Prometric. Prometric will just send you back to us for that approval. And essentially, we will accommodate you under the ADA. So I get, we get the breast pump one all the time. So Perfect. we will give you the additional breaks. What we won't do is we won't let you pump while you're taking your test because we don't want to record that. Sorry. So the accommodation experience will mirror the in-center policies. We can do any accommodation in person or in a remote setting with the sole exception that if you have an accommodation that requires a physical prometric staffer to physically provide you assistance, then you will be required to go into the testing center strictly because they can't send staff people to people's personal homes for liability reasons. Gotcha. I also think, too, um, I was watching some of the chat going back and forth, and some people are like, whoa, this is intense. Um, and and it's, it's comprehensive. I want to say it's very comprehensive versus intense. And Liz, mm -hmm. you've done a great job of, like, painting the whole picture of what this virtual proctoring is going to be, which is new for, for mm -hmm. all of us, and right? And I'm also going to say that we're all adults, and when's the last time we had to go, I'm going to age myself and take a little Scantron test, you know, and you yeah. have your little cardboard cubby. I will say, though, um, the in-person testing, I think, is more intimidating, right? I took mine five years ago to get my CMPHC. And literally, you are like 10 times worse than TSA post 9-11. I was like, they, I'd take my earrings off. I couldn't wear my wedding mm -hmm. ring. I couldn't have my Fitbit. You know, I, I had to unroll my cuffs. When, if I wanted to get up to take a break, I had to raise my hand and stand there until someone came and walked me out. So I want to say that if you're not like a big test taker, like taking this in the comfort of your home seems so inviting. 
and the, you know, make sure your space is clean and make sure what you have on your walls. I would say just look at it as a lens of nobody's there with you physically, right? So just mm -hmm. remove anything that would remotely resemblance something that's going to um, be a way to cheat or not be, you know, on your best behavior, which we're not saying that anyone's going to do that, but we're saying there's only so much we can see in this virtual environment. So you're doing, mm -hmm. you're setting us up ahead of time to know all the intricacies of this conversion. And this is the first conversion for us, right? So it's going to be a test and learn and we'll get feedback from folks on what yes. they wish they would have known or what we could do better, right? It, absolutely. But also remember that this is not new to the testing industry. So we're the first events credential that is going down this pathway. But remote proctoring has been something that's been in development for accredited certification programs for the last few years. So remember that what we want to see as we go through this process is that people are, we're taking the best practices from the doctors, from the lawyers, and we're instituting them here, and we're working with Prometric, and they're a wonderful partner. They're doing about 10,000 hours of remotely proctored exams a day. So there's a lot of background and expertise, and we work so diligently with the commission to set up policies and procedures that protect the rigor of the exam, but also create an environment that's going to be comfortable for our candidates. So this is truly personal preference. If you feel that you would have a better result going to a testing center, go to a testing center. If you feel more comfortable taking the exam at home, take the exam at home. There's nothing that says that, you know, it's the same level of rigor at both. It's the same exam at both. Obviously, there's multiple versions of the CMP, but there's not, you know, versions that are only tested in one environment. Set yourself up for success. So we're coming up three minutes to where we need to um, end the call. Mm -hmm. But two things. One is, is this really was to prepare us for the conversion to virtual proctoring. We have a lot of questions, though, coming in, more of how do I prepare myself for the exam, right? The yes. materials and this and that. Do we offer anything in the near future in which someone can talk to someone about all of those exam prep type questions? Would perhaps office hours be the right place to do that? I would say absolutely. So office hours are, I would call them a mixed bag. Just remember back to university when you went by your professor's office hours and just asked anything you wanted. So we're doing office hours this Thursday. We'll do them next Thursday as well. You can literally ask us anything. Um, members of the commission will be there. We can talk through prep. We can talk through remote proctoring, whatever is top of mind for people. I'm also going to just share all of the staff team, all of our personal emails, anyone on this list whose face you're looking at right now can answer questions about preparing for the exam. We also, if you have your heart set on listening to another webinar, we did an exam preparation webinar that was back in April that's still posted up on YouTube. It's complimentary and free for you to view. So if you want to do a deep dive on exam preparation, that video is still available. We will do another deep dive at a later date. We just thought it was really important based upon the questions we've been getting to focus really intently on remote proctoring today. And then um, in office hours, which those are posted on our website, right? So people can Correct. see what time zone, perfect. And then on office hours, or maybe perhaps um, as a closing thought, uh, Liz, can, can you tell folks a little bit about the exam prep materials, right? And, and I apologize, I should know this, but, um, you know, do we necessarily rec recommend all the different things that are out there, or do should we look for if it's a preferred provider? Because one of the things I want to be sure is there's a lot of motivated people on this yes. um, chat, and I want to make sure that they are referencing the appropriate material that's most up to date to the exam itself. Sure. So officially, we recommend those three resources, which are three books. The EIC manual, which is on the ninth edition, the 2020 version of the APEX glossary, again, through Events Industry Council, and the most recent edition of PCMA's Professional Meetings Manual. 
management. Now, not, we know that not everyone can just read a book and feel prepared to take a test. There's lots of supplemental study groups out there. Now, EIC does not officially endorse or recommend one study group over another. I would say that the many of them do offer classes through our preferred provider program, which means that we have vetted the, that, for, that content for um, alignment with the CMP international standards, but we're not saying that they're comprehensive exam prep programs. So my best recommendation is do your due diligence. There are some study groups that are wonderful. I'm sure there's some that are bluntly not as helpful. A lot of it also is going to come down to personal style of how do you learn best. So there's a lot of personal discretion in there. So do your research, do your due diligence before you buy some study groups. There's a lot of good options out there, but the core fundamentals is EIC does not require a study group. You can go back to those reference texts to feel prepared to take your exam. Perfect, perfect. Well, we're one minute past. I just personally wanna say thank you for letting me be included in today's call. And um, I was happy to join you all. And if anyone needs anything from me, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I wish you all the very best in your endeavors to attain your CMP or your HC. And I wish you all health and happiness. Thank you all.